If you thought my end of year collection videos were guitar overload, wait until you see this website. Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. So about a week ago we documented the old Hickory Les Paul, and during that video a few different examples flashed across the screen. And the owner of this one was very happy to see it, and he very kindly pointed out to me his website, Guitar Motel. And my goodness, this is absolute guitar heaven for people who just want to look at cool guitars online, it never ends! So for today, let's check out his Gibsons, maybe for a Fender Friday we'll check out some other stuff. But we're starting today off with his 2004 Les Paul Diamond Cut in flip-flop blue. This is quite the fascinating Les Paul custom shop. The reason I'm starting with this one first is he's actually looking to acquire more of these if you happen to own one. So you can either reach out to him directly or through me, but it just looks like a regular Les Paul standard but without the binding that has these interesting cross sections all within it that creates this very interesting raised diamond pattern throughout the entire thing. But I suppose you could say it has slightly snakeskin-like vibes to it as well. The problem is, is unbound Les Paul Paul's look too much like studios, but at least we have the binding on the fretboard and the gold hardware. But the back's just straight black, and judging by that serial number, it was done in 2004. Next, we have one from 1987, which is custom painted with a Duran Duran Japanese single cover called My Own Way. Now looking at that, and then coming over here to the yellowed over version after it's aged for about three decades, maybe it doesn't have the same appeal as it had when it was brand new. But with the description, I was like, is that really original? Did it get painted after the factory? I mean, the back is a cool pink color, but then I saw it. The awesome custom shop original decal. Yeah, that's custom artwork. It's kind of like the Jim O'Connors that we've talked about before. Just a little bit more tasteful. You can't have an Ultra Gibson collection without one of these. This is one of the 12 string SGs, but it's not the one that I've documented. That was the string through version. This is one I'm still kind of looking for the right one for. It just looks like a regular SG down here, but then we have an obnoxiously long headstock. It's like slicing an EDS 1275 in half, and then that's what you got. But of course, you have to have a maple neck on one of these. But before we continue looking at these awesome guitars, let's have a word from our sponsor, Sweetwater. I've been a customer of theirs for well over 10 years. If you need any type of new music gear, they are the place to go. I find that they're one of the easiest ones to shop online from because I'm buying a lot of high-end guitars, right? So I want to be able to see the top, I want to know how much it weighs, and I want it presented in a manner that makes a lot of sense. And that's exactly what their website offers. They even have a used gear marketplace. And if you're local to their Fort Wayne, Indiana campus, they also have music lessons, they have some cool events, and hey, they also do monthly giveaways that you can enter by clicking that link in the description. Thank you Sweetwater for sponsoring tonight's episode, now let's get back to some cool guitars. But his next two guitars might save the day. We've got the Amazing Spider-Man, which was a custom shop creation of about 75 guitars. But the cool thing about these is they were signed by Stan Lee. Then the other half were signed by John, and it looks like this is one of these Stan Lee versions. But the thing I never liked about this particular model is the fact that it's just a bolt-on graphic. It's very similar to the New Century Les Pauls, and those things are dirt cheap, but this one has Spider-Man stuff going on. I would say the most unique thing about this particular model has to be the fretboard inlays being spider webs. And of course you get your spider on the headstock, Gibson Mother of Pearl logo, but nothing too crazy going on on the back. But these things right here, the 2002 Custom Shop Spider-Man movie Les Pauls, these are insanely collectible. And these things get faked all the time. We still have a graphic, but at least it's not bolted onto the top, but it's a wrap tail piece with two humbuckers still in full controls. So basically just a Les Paul standard, but done up a little bit differently. You've got a slightly bigger spider on the headstock, and then it looks like we've got like a dark brownish back, maybe with a little bit of a red hue. So yeah, if you ever see one of these in the wild, you might want to pick it up, because most were only available as contest giveaway guitars. And I've also heard of a few that were actually given to people who worked on the film. But if those are a bit too crazy for you, let's dial it back. Here's a 1975 Les Paul recording in a beautifully aged yellow finish, very boldly signed by Les Paul. That's actually pretty rare to just get his signature. Usually it's keep picking or one of the few other catchphrases before his name. And that's actually a secret code because he would talk to you before so he would sign it differently if he knew you played guitar or if he knew you didn't play guitar or if it was a charity raffle or a giveaway of some sort. But you have to love the black outer binding on these. Gives them a very unique look. Next up is a very interesting SG-2. Now this one looks like an aftermarket paint job. That's why I was confused about that first one because I had selected all these to talk about at the beginning. But yeah, that one's definitely been upgraded as far as the tailpiece goes. But when these things normally look like this, I would say this finish actually livens things up a bit. Oh wow, I wasn't expecting that back. That's nice. 
But next up here, it's a Big Mac Daddy, the Les Paul, number eight of 77. This right here was actually my very first the Les Paul. If I remember correctly, I think this is the one that has some finish checking on the top, but still to this day, it is the most unaged lacquer version that I've ever ran across. I didn't realize just how special my first one was. And you might be saying, hey, Trogoli, if this was your old guitar, how did you not know about Guitar Motel before this? Well, I had actually sold this to Don Green who ran HeadlessUSA.com. Basically, if you know about Steinberger guitars, you know about him. He's the guy you went to get them fixed. He dedicated his life to it. And unfortunately, he just recently passed away, and that came as such a shock to me because I didn't know until his email about the old Hickory Les Paul. So I think he was trying to touch base with me in case I come across anything interesting that he might want to add to his collection. Because Don was always telling me, my client is interested in a whole bunch of stuff, but little did I know the truth extent of it all. But yes, you can actually find an old video of this on my YouTube channel if you want to see it in depth. But gotta say, these photos do it absolute justice. It's nice. On top of that, he also has one of my old 2550s. Now, it's not this one, but this is a very nice new old stock. With the plastic still on the pick guard yet, that's a really good top for a 2550. Most 2550s kind of have lame tops, in my opinion, despite being really cool limited editions. But I suppose beggars can't be choosers in this era, because that's what makes these things special, is they are two-piece tops in the three-piece top era. But it was definitely one of his natural ones. Now, I could go through my old videos and look up the serial numbers, but he's got a couple of these. But here's the thing that stinks about natural 2550s is the sustain sisters that they use around the bridge and tailpiece. They have this rubber around it and that causes this yellow discoloration over time. So it, it's just physically impossible to find a perfect one. But how's this for a cool model? I've been wanting to document one of these. It's an ES-175 Charlie Christian model, aka the ES-175CC. Basically, a 175, but with a giant Charlie Christian pickup in it. So of course we need to document it because I've never actually tried a full-on one in a guitar. I'm curious, what's going on with these inlays? Why are they red? Did it just happen to be that particular mother of pearl? Or were they stained? Or is it like a colorful abalone? I'm not sure. He also has one of the beautiful ES artists. I haven't documented one of these, mainly because I'm just not a big fan of the artist series. They're insanely cool because of their headstock, and they generally do have pretty nice flame maple tops, but the problem is, you see all this checking going on here? It's because they used real celluloid pick guards on these, and as they age and off gas, it destroys the finish, and the pick guard disintegrates. That's also the same reason why you have this discoloration right here on the pickups. So if you have an ES artist, please, Take your pick guard off, get a reproduction. Your future self will thank you. But that's got a nice back too. Nice flame in the neck as well. And then he's just got a whole bunch of spotlights. I think I counted four on his website. This is a pretty nice top. Appears to be in nice condition. Still has the Tim Shaw PAF stickers. That's always nice. And this one is serial number 141. I don't think I've owned that one before. Then we've got this version of Antiques Sunburst, again, with the PAF stickers on it. This one's grown on me the more I look at it, with serial number 196. Here's a pretty aged antique natural, again with the stickers, with a very uniform pinstripe top. And I don't know what it is about the antique natural finish. A lot of them get the staining around the Gibson logo. I think it's what they use to fill around it, but that's a really pale center stripe on this one. But nice wood grain figuring back here. And number 182. And the last one, number 54. This one's a little bit more to my styling. I love it when it's a little bit more wavy like this. It's got the wood grain in the center. It's the only one in his collection that doesn't have the stickers, but I can see why he made an exception. I love it when they've got the wavy wood grain on the headstock too. Not quite sure what's going on with the staining, but yeah, that's a nice one. And then he has an incredible collection of American guitars. So he has the 1985 Stars and Stripes. So they made about nine of these, is what people say. I've honestly seen so many of these, I think there might be more than that, but that's what shipping ledgers are saying. Most of these are just plain mahogany, so to have one extra patriotic, it's fun. But then he also has some 90s and 2000s iterations. Like, I didn't even know this thing existed. It's kind of an interesting other take on Stars and Stripes. It definitely looks very of that era, is the best way to put that. Then you've got the star inlays and a much more refined headstock than the 80s versions and all white on the back. But this thing absolutely blew my mind. 2001 concentric flag design, they call it. That's a very striking one. But I suppose if you collect these map guitars, you definitely need one of each. I'm really curious, did they do the design on the back? No, it's blue, okay. 
I thought that was black, but no, it just looks like very dark blue. So it's still red, white, and blue, just in a different way. I actually like that a lot more now that I see it that way. And here's another one with another different flag design. And then he's got a whole plethora of Les Pauls that have the US flag on it, but I thought this was the coolest one, the whole metallic nature of it. So it's blending the two things that Gibson was doing in the early 2000s. But that has a very nice side profile shot. Still the natural mahogany paired with the rosewood fretboard, and then you got your glitter top. And oh, fascinating. I wonder if they just had extra decals left over from the All-American series and they decided to slap that on there. Or was this particular Les Paul classic part of the All-American series? I thought this Explorer was kind of cool. So this is like the whole 90s style, but it's a very early one, still technically 1989, so it just makes it really cool. Beautiful tobacco sunburst going on here. Ooh, and matching back, that's pretty slick. This 1990 Les Paul Classic is an ex-Brad Whitford of Aerosmith guitar. Man, that really looks like the early Slash model that they only made four of. Because before the Snake Pit, there was technically a signature Slash, but it was basically just made for him without a production release. So I wonder if this was one of those and somehow Brad Whitford got a hold of it. All I gotta say is that is a really cool piece of Gibson history. Whoa, what is that? Oh, wow. Nice. I mean, technically 1989 is the first year of the Les Paul Classic, but that one was definitely special. Speaking of special 90s guitars, here's one of those white custom Super 400s that I'm still waiting for a nice clean one to show up. I have documented a black one if you want to see one closer up, but that is very clean. I mean, most of these that show up, they're not in very good condition anymore. Kind of cool to see how little this one's actually aged. You can tell this left the factory in a slightly aged white finish hue instead of perfect white because the binding is still white. Put me on the list as jealous of that one. Then we've got a beautiful Jimmy Wallace 1992. Shops like Guitar Trader and Strings and Things get all the attention in the prehistoric era, but Jimmy Wallace shop did a whole bunch of stuff, and they're still active yet today. That is a very nice tiger top. And yeah, it's got that characteristic early 90s weird looking headstock. But I say that in a good way. I like that wood grain on the back too. Here's one of those Karina SG standards we were just talking about a couple of days ago. They made a quite a handful of these, 500. Much more than the Flying V that we were talking about. Interesting that this one inlay is aged, whereas the rest of them aren't. Then of course, an ultra collection like this would not be complete without the full set of 1994 Centennial guitars, but I'm just gonna look at this one, the 1994 standard, because that has a very unique top. And that is one of the better preserved ones I've ever seen. For whatever reason, the knobs never stand the test of time, but that's just to be expected, unfortunately. 1898, that's one of the first ones, because it starts 1894, and then it goes up through 1994. But this was drool worthy. The Corvette Les Paul, these things are expensive and hard to find in clean shape. He's got the Horizon Blue. He's got the Tuxedo Black. He's got the Roman Red and the Cascade Green. <laughs> what a fantastic set there, my friend. Now he also has some of these Georges St. Pierre's. This one, I'm not a big fan of it. It's, it's one of those zombie virus ones. It has a unique charm, but the next one, this one I'm jealous of. Number 103 of 103. It's always cool to me if you have number one or if you have the very last one. All the other numbers, they don't really matter unless it pertains to the guitar, like number 19 of the 1979 Adam Jones. It says 1979 on the back of the headstock. But this one is a pink paisley. Now, in my own personal collection, I have this awesome gold paisley. It's still my favorite one that I've ever seen out of the Georges St. Pierre's. And if I remember correctly, I think mine's like number 101. So they were definitely doing the cool paisleys at the end. Oh, and yeah, he's got a snake pit. He had found my video about the snake pit scam, and he said this website was up at that point in time, so I could have had pretty good photos to look through, but for whatever reason, these photos didn't show up in my journey. However, this would have been perfect. 100% perfect to have, because I could not find good photos like these when trying to authenticate that one, but yeah. One day I'll get a snake pit. Actually, recently, one just showed up on German eBay. I mean, he wants way too much, and then, about a couple of days later, I get a message from somebody thinking about maybe he wants to trade some guitars for his. His wasn't a first run one though, so we'll have to see if the deal is right. But I would love to end that cycle as, yes, I finally did get a real snake pit. And of course we can take a look at his old hickories again. While creating that video, I was looking at this one going, yep, that is a good one. It's got all the different colors, but it's primarily dark, so that's nice. And his neck is half and half. 
kind of like what I liked about mine, but his body's not quite half and half. That's what I love about mine. It's got that diagonal crisscross that works against the entire thing. But his serial number's not too far from mine. It seems in that serial number range, they used like the best half and half woods. Then he's also got this... If you want dark, that is great. It's got a little bit of a different vibe to it. Then the back has a little bit more color. That's why I love the old Hickory models. There's just so many colorations that you can find. Next up, we have a master built by James McDonald, the Muse. I'll be honest, having a acoustic guitar on your Les Paul, that's kind of funny. Okay, I, I get it now. I was going to say it's not my favorite, but now it's just hilarious. But what I liked was this. Wow, that's fancy. That's stylized in a way that looks boutique. And oh, we've got a pick on the inside of the guitar. But look at this crazy thing. 1999 Les Paul Standard Psycho, uh, apparently. Built for Ted Nugent, but never delivered to him. It really reminds me of the Zebra Explorer that I lost out in the auction. But it's all about the headstock on that one for me. That's cool. Although I think ultimately I prefer Zebra Stripes other than whatever's going on here. And then of course he's got one of these Les Paul acoustics. We'll document one of those when I find the right one. He's got another one similar to that acoustic, but this time with a Joker design on it. And it's built after a Les Paul Jr. And it's got the really cool headstock. I love that. I wish Gibson would bring that back into production. That looks good. And oh, Stinger. Maybe not the most beautifully crafted Stinger, but a Stinger nonetheless. And then lastly, I do need to document one of these, the 2002 Les Paul 50th Anniversary Flamed Koa. You get awesome Koa tops on these. You get the interesting wooden knobs that have the mother of pearl dot inlays on them so you know where you're going. You get the SJ200 style inlays that up until this point, the only other model that I know kind of used that was the House of Guitars limited edition Les Paul Studio. But these ones are abalone. And then the top three are rectangles. And of course you get the abalone and the headstock. But if that wasn't enough, they get quilted maple bodies. That looks like it's one piece too. That's how I imagine the suspect. I mean, it's possible that they did the laminated sides, but the end grain seems to match up that I think that's just a straight up maple body. And then you kind of get the acoustic neck going on here with the two piece maple and the center stripe of walnut. These used to not be all that expensive, but they've gotten very pricey lately. I don't think I would mind having one of those in my collection. So troglodytes, uh, obviously I gotta tip my hat to the guy. He's created a beautiful website. I have plans of creating something similar with my own collection, but the execution here is just flawless and phenomenal. I don't know what he does for a living, but I love his website. And if you wanna check it out, it's just guitarmotel.net. You can be here for days just looking at stuff. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you tomorrow on the next one. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.